the other way around. Yeah, but then they but not cheese yaka uh kage kai sahai. Emily more you had to a saw kitch kan kutzik teach. But now I teach in Colorado. Honorable people, in the spirit of this conference, I'm trying to practice a little of my poor Quinket language skills, so please forgive me. I grew up in Ketchikan, although today I'm a professor at Colorado State University, and it's very good to be back in Quinket Ani today, so thank you, Ishmael, for putting me on this camera. My paper this morning looks at Charles Stoss Brown, who is the head carver at Saxon for the CCC totem pole restoration project in the late 1930s. As many of you know, the CCC stands for the Civilian Conservation Corps, which was a work relief program that President Roosevelt designed to give men work during the Great Depression, and at the same time to build infrastructure and recreational opportunities that would benefit the nation. One of the most interesting projects projects in Alaska was this total pole restoration project from 1938 to 1942. Over the course of these four years, more than 100 19th century total poles were removed with native permission from uninhabited Quinket and Haida villages, brought to the CCC camps for restoration or replication, and then re-erected in six newly invented totem parks that were intended to attract tourists to the area. This was Saxon's Stone Park. This was a rich and complex program involving dif difficult compromises and many misrepresentations of the meanings of totem poles and clan prerogatives, as well as a fair number of misunderstandings between Clinton and Haida communities and the Forest Service officials who oversaw this totem pole restoration program. Yet the CCC also encouraged a young generation of men to work with some of the last remaining carvers who had been trained in the 19th century apprenticeship tradition and to learn the clan stories of totem poles after years of government suppression of totem pole carving. The CCC program also created totem parks that continue to rank among the top tourist attractions today and as many of you know, many of these parks continue to undergo restorations in May. Um, a beautiful new clan house at Shakes Island is dedicated, and I love this picture because that's the CCC sign from the last restoration that, that took place in 1940. Despite their importance, the CCC total parks have never been given an in-depth study of their own, and very few of the individual CCC carvers have been studied. Northwest Coast Native Art Scholarship has tended to label interwar carving as the lowest of the low in the history of Northwest Coast Native Art. And so CCC carvers are usually glossed over as poor quality artists working for a government project that had little to do with Lincoln and Haida culture. When I wrote my dissertation on the CCC parks, however, I really started to admire some of the carvings that I saw. And I felt it was important to take a closer look at some of the head carvers while their work was still extant. <clears throat> One of the carvers whose work I really came to admire was Charles Brown, the head carver for the CCC camp at Saxman. And so this morning I just wanted to make, um, give you a brief introduction to him and to some of his work. Why I consider him a master Southern Pinket carver of the second quarter of the 20th century. Charles Stoss Brown was born in Ketchikan on April 16, 1899. The best information that I have is that through his mother, Annie John, he was Chalk Pit, Eagle House of the Nechari Sanya Korn. Through his father, William Brown, who's pictured here on the left of the Abe Lincoln finial that's now over in the Alaska State Museum, he was Tanta Kwan Tekwedi Yadi. 39 years old when the totem pole restoration program began, Charles Brown was one of the youngest lead carvers for the CCC, and he had very little carving experience being a boat builder by trade. Yet he was knowledgeable about Plinket culture and became an important native liaison for the U.S. Forest Service. 
Viola Garfield, the University of Washington anthropologist who helped to advise the Forest Service on the CCC project, told her Forest Service colleagues, quote, they had a treasure in this man, and that she preferred Brown over any other informant, as Native cultural advisors were called then. In fact, Brown was one of the primary translators and contributors to the clan stories published in The Wolf and the Raven, the well-known book about Southeast Alaska's totem poles that was compiled as part of the CCC program. The primary author of that book, Viola Garfield, wrote in a private letter to her co-author that, quote, Mr. Brown deserves as much mention as either of us for authorship of the book since he has done so much research and actual writing of the stories. Unquote. Unfortunately, however, Brown was only thanked in the credits for his work and not listed as a third author of this best-selling text. And it is, I believe, in its sixth edition now. It's one of the all-time um, bestsellers for the University of Washington Press. So where did Charles Brown learn to carve? Forest Service correspondence notes that he learned to carve toilet holes from his father. William Brown, who was born January 1870 in Fort Tongass. William Brown was a high-ranking Clinket who was well-versed in traditional protocols and the material culture necessary to carry them out. In interviews that Charles Brown recorded at the Lowe Museum at the University of California, Berkeley in 1964, the younger Brown noted that his father's Clinket name translated as Chief Crime Wolf and listed among his possessions two Chilkat blankets, two clan hats, a raven rattle, and a 38-inch copper shield, the highly valuable form of which was tattooed onto the back of William Brown's hand. William Brown also owned at least one totem pole from Old Tongass, the climbing bear pole, which you can see here on the left. And this is an old plaque that's now in a private collection in Ketchikan, identifying that pole that was moved to Ketchikan in the 1920s with William Brown's permission. The elder Brown must have had some training as a carver, and he actually served as the head carver at Saxon for the Saxon CCC before his son took over. We know that William Brown did the final ad scenes of the replica of the so-called Seattle Pool, which many of you probably know was stolen from Tongass Village by a group of Seattle businessmen in 1899 and then re-erected <coughs> in Pioneer Square downtown. In the 1930s, a vandal set fire to the pole and badly damaged it. So the CCC in Alaska was commissioned to replicate it. And somewhat ironically for a Tongass man who knew this original had been stolen, it was William Brown that did the final ads work on the replica. <coughs> And this is a photograph of the replica of the Seattle pole on a ship being transported back to Seattle. And I think you can see the beautiful finishing ads work that William Brown did on this pole. William Brown also completed the totem pole that now stands at the governor's mansion in Juneau, which had been started by Charlie Tadcock, a Clinket carver originally from Haines. It's interesting to note that the cheeks of the human figures on the governor's pole featured U-forms and split U's that have gracefully tapering points. We'll see this all over um, William Brown and Charles Brown's works. Um, similar U-forms would become a hallmark of Charles Brown's totem pole figures, like his copy of the man wearing a brown bear or a bear hat from Cat Island near Tongass, or on other poles that he made at Little Light. So again, these beautiful youth forms, sometimes with old woods, he almost always used these on the cheeks of his human figures. Importantly, U forms on the cheeks of human figures are not common on other northern poles carved or replicated by the CCC. However, they do appear on a totem pole pictured in Edward Moybridge's photograph of Tongass Village in 1868. And I hope you can see up here on this figure wearing the potlatch hat, again, these new forms on the cheeks. So I'm interested if there's some kind of <coughs> southern lineage that William Brown and Charles Brown were 
some kind of aesthetic lens that they're really using here. Other characteristics of Charles Brown's work are distinctive. Following the careful modeling of the best 19th century poles, Charles Brown took pains to create rounded facial forms and subtle relief work on his poles for the CCC. Rather than simply painting the U-forms on the cheeks, and then we stick back here. If you can see here, I try to take a photograph, it's a little bit blurry, but these U-forms are, are raised in relief just a few centimeters above the rest of the pole. He really took time to raise all of these elements above the pole and create these beautiful contours. His cheeks are always, instead of this line that we see on some CCC poles, <coughs> kind of just more of a straight mouth line. Charles Brown always took the time to kind of flare the cheeks out and create these beautifully modeled, beautifully modeled forms that I, I don't think have been fully appreciated before. He also always included compass points at the center of his eyes. You can see them in this minute carving of a land otter that's on a shaman staff I'll talk about in one moment. And, sorry, let me just get forward here. This wandering raven pole at Totem Bight, this frontal pole that you can see on the front of the house, is interesting to me for two reasons. One is that it's based on the Seattle pole, which Charles Brown had helped to replicate after the Vandals fire in Seattle. When he had the opportunity to design a new pole for the clan house at Totem Bight, he chose to reference the same crests and crest stories as the Seattle Pole. And I'm really tempted to think this was Brown's way of repatriating a pole that had been stolen from Thomas Village, bringing it back. And I think that's buttressed by the, the fact that Brown and other CCC carvers had lobbied to have Totem, Boy, Totem Point, Totem Bite named Tongas Point. They really wanted it to reference the Tonga Kwan in Ketchikan. So I think he was, he was kind of bringing this pole back. The Wandering Raven Pole is also interesting because of its use of appended wings. You can see them up at this top figure and down again at the raven of the mass, at the head of the mass figure. Sometimes these wings have been read as touristic concessions that bow to the incredibly popular Kwakwakua Thunderbird House Post from Alert Bay that featured thunderbirds with outstretched wings. But it's important to note that there were several examples of 19th century totem poles with appended wings in Clinket territory in southern southeast Alaska. And these are some images of early poles from Thomas Village. This is the sun raven pole with appended wings. The base of the proud raven pole where the Lincoln finial is at the top also had places to append wings. This was a very southern blanket tradition as well. Um, this pole on the, on the right, the Proud Raven pole, was said to have been carved by a Simshan artist from Point Simpson. Closer to Kwakwakiwak territory, he may have brought the extended wing motif with him into blanket territory. But in any case, appended wings were an established motif in southern blanket carving, and Brown's use of them for the wandering raven pole was in keeping with the classical work from his father's home village. If Brown's attention to 19th century carving traditions argues for a closer look at the aesthetics of his work for the CCC, he also deserves attention for advancing the New Deal's goal of art used for social cohesion. And what I mean by that was that art was really meant to bind communities together during the New Deal. This was a huge impetus of Roosevelt's program. Brown's reputation as a motivator and mediator is still remembered by Clinton's and Saxon today. As his great nephew, Willard Jackson, told me, Brown was, quote, someone who put a lot of strife to rest, unquote. Jackson recounted a family story where Charlie would gauge the cooperative attitude of CCC enrollees loaded on a bus for work to tow and bite. If the men were not positive and ready to work for the day, Brown would tell the bus driver to turn around. 
So we always wanted to make sure everybody was with him in this effort to recarve his poles. And I think it really is telling that Brown wanted um, other people to engage with him to take this opportunity of using government money to um, relearn some of the clan stories, relearn some of the traditions. Brown's interest in the New Deal totem parks is an opportunity to learn about Clinket clan stories and carbon traditions is key, I believe, to interpreting an original totem pole that Brown designed for totem bite. I'm so sorry, I don't have a full picture of this. It's a super tall pole. It's located right out on the point in front of the totem bite clan house overlooking the water, so it's kind of difficult to get a photograph of it, but I'll show you pictures of the different parts. Topped by the figure of a, sh a shaman, or ich, the pole featured the crests of halibut, two land otters, a wind eagle, a human holding a salmon, a man holding a frog, another frog, a cormorant, a raven, a halibut, and finally at the bottom, a bear. In The Wolf and the Raven, Garfield and Forrest listed stories for two clusters of figures on the pole. Near the top, the eagle and man holding the salmon recall the story of the chief's nephew who fed eagles. A well-known Clinket story of a boy who, had abandoned, who was abandoned by his clan, but regained wealth when eagles brought him food to thank him for feeding them. Garfield and Forrest also identified the bottom group um, as a cormorant, ha raven, halibut, and grizzly bear as a reference to one of the adventures of Raven. These stories were transcriptions of Clinket stories that Brown himself may have collected and used to develop a design for this original pole. Yet one critical figure on the pole at the point that Garfield and Forrest do not interpret is the ich at the very top, which I got a good look at and it was down for restoration recently. I think it's always been so high up that no one's been able to really look at this incredible carving. This is a crucial figure to the totem pole, and it's clear that Brown lavished much attention to his carving and painting. The shaman's mouth is characteristically brown, with that flaring cheek ridge again, this crimped hair that he's done with the shaman's kind of unkept hair, and he's incised, not U-forms, but these beautiful rays that um, come down the cheeks of the ink. The shaman has his eyes closed, he's clearly in a trance, <coughs> he holds this beautiful, um, minutely carved land otter, as you can see the compass point, the, the teeth are minutely chiseled and angled out. It's really lavished attention on this small carving. And finally, the shaman is <coughs> apron incised with um, a skeletal bear, I think. <coughs> the shaman on Brown's 1940 totem pole is a, is a significant kind of symbol, I believe, for Brown's approach to the totem pole restoration project of the CCC. The Schmill has made an important suggestion to me that Brown may have intended to show this ich in a trance as the moment when the ich sounds out his messengers, his gates, <coughs> to conduct spiritual work and to foretell good or bad that may arrive in the community. Charles Brown himself talked about the work of the gate during his interviews that he conducted at the Bowie Museum at the University of California, Berkeley in 1964. And I have a little audio clip. Let me just see if it'll work. I, I don't think it will. But I see that these speakers are kind of on. This is Charles Brown. If it works, this will be Charles Brown talking about um, an um, ict in a trance. Let's see. I don't think it's going to work. So I'm not going to waste your time with that. I'm sorry. It's actually, it gave me shivers to find these recordings at Berkeley because I studied his work visually for so long, and then here was his voice talking from the 1960s. But this particular clip I was going to try to play was him talking about the ict in a transcending on me to do good work for the community. And I think that's important because it parallels the kind of work that Charles Brown seems to have hoped to enact for his own community 
by carbon for the CCC. <coughs> Nora and Richard Dowenhauer have written that, quote, shamanism in Klinka tradition, or at least in theory and its ideal form, was devoted to physical and spiritual healing and to other positive forces in the community, <coughs> such as telepathy. Unquote. Such a role paralleled Charles Brown's interest in totem pole carving for the CCC as an opportunity to, re to restore a spiritual balance and prosperity for his Clinket community in Ketchikan and Saxon. One of the few statements that the Forest Service publicized of a native person speaking about the CCC totem parks was this remark by Charles Brown. <coughs> the story of our father's totems was nearly dead, but now once again is being brought to life. Once more, our old familiar totems will proudly face the world with new war paints. The makers of these old poles will not have died in vain. May these old poles help to bring about prosperity to our people. Um, this was similar, I believe, this hope that by carving those totem poles, he can help bring a kind of prosperity to his community, I think is similar to this idea of the shaman in the trance sending out Yehi as part of his spiritual work. And it's for those kinds of reasons, it strengthens my belief that Brown's cultural knowledge and carving prowess should rank him as a master carver of 20th century carving. Thank you.